Hello and welcome to Germany in Focus, a news podcast made possible by the locals members. This week we're talking about a culture birthday present for 18-year-olds in Germany. We are looking into the thorny nature of neighbor disputes when it comes to smoking on your balcony. The latest draft of the German citizenship reform is being finalized by the government. We are going to dig deep into that, explore why there's been a delay in the process, and hear from an immigration lawyer on what you should know if you're applying for citizenship in Germany. Lastly, we will talk about summer getaways that you should definitely do, whether it's for a weekend away or even just a wee day trip in Germany. I'm Rachel Loxton, and I'm in Berlin today with journalists Aaron Burnett and Imogen Goodman. Hello, how are you both doing? Hello. Hi. By the time this episode airs, I will be driving to the falls for a wine weekend. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I'm, I'm excited about that. Um, it's about six and a half to seven hours of driving, though, and only two of us have licenses. So I will be looking forward to that Riesling when I get there. Hopefully mm. I'll come back with some recommendations for y'all. Definitely. And this is the boys' trip, isn't it? Yes, this is the men's trip, yeah. <laughs> Imogen, are you well? Yeah, I'm really well, thank you. In fact, by the time the episode comes out for me, I will hopefully have done my citizenship test, uh, which is scheduled for tomorrow evening, so on Thursday. So I haven't actually done much formal prep for it, but I have helped out friends with their preparations in the past, so I feel like I kind of know what to expect. Also, I have to say, writing for the local and chatting with you guys mm -hmm. almost every week has been brilliant prep in and of itself. I feel like I've accumulated quite a bit of nerdy political knowledge over the years. <laughs> so this is finally my time to shine. Finally, someone's going to ask me the difference between the Bundesrat and the Bundestag at long last. <laughs> um, so it should be good. Hopefully it'll go well. Absolutely. I Coming feel like, in handy. Yeah, I feel like you're going to be writing an essay for them. <laughs> I think at so. At the end of it, you'll just be talking about all the intricacies <laughs> of German politics and life. Definitely. I'll bring my own spare sheet of paper so I can add notes to the multiple choice selection if I have any <laughs> any comments. Listeners <laughs> to Fantastic. Germany in Focus can just say that they're studying for the citizenship test. No Definitely. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, good luck. Thank you. So let's talk about a cool thing coming up in June in Germany. Young people who turn 18 in 2023 are getting a kind of birthday present. They are to receive a 200 euro Kultur Pass or a Culture Pass. And this follows similar projects in other countries, including France, Spain and Italy. Imogen, can you tell us more about this? Yes, absolutely. This is a really exciting government project um, and it really has two major aims. Uh, so the first is, of course, to give young people an opportunity to get out and about and experience live culture in a way that they just weren't able to during the pandemic. And the second is really to secure the future of cultural institutions in Germany in the future. So places like theatres, galleries, museums and concert halls, for instance. Sadly, as I think we're all aware the cultural industry was one of the major victims of the pandemic a couple of years ago. So the successive lockdowns really, really hit these places very hard. And they've kind of struggled to get people back through their doors and kind of encourage people to break out of that cycle of staying home um, following the pandemic. So Culture Minister Claudia Roth uh, has basically said that she wants to offer this 200 euros Kultur Pass or Culture Pass to around 750,000 people uh, who turn 18 this year as a kind of birthday present. Um, and she's really hoping this will get more young people excited about the diverse cultural experiences that Germany has to offer. I think the pandemic was just really hard hitting uh, for young people in their teens because these are really significant years of their lives. So it's a really nice idea, I think, to get them out of the house and maybe win over a new generation of live music fans, theatre fans, maybe even opera fans uh, for the future. Yeah, really cool. And that's right, because so many of these places had to shut in the pandemic lockdowns, didn't they? For months on end. Definitely, they did. Um, and obviously, you know, if live performance is your bread and butter and and people aren't allowed out to these events, that really is going to hit your revenues pretty hard and, and hit your livelihood. 
And how does this cultural pass work? How can people get it? Well, you can kind of think of the culture pass as a little bit like a voucher that young people can use to buy all sorts of cultural things like tickets to cultural events, entrance tickets, and even products like uh, books or sheet music. Uh, so young people will essentially have 200 euros credit that they can spend on a special culture pass platform over two years, which will be a kind of big marketplace for event tickets or other cultural offers. It's probably important to mention, though, that this won't be handed out automatically. So people who turn 18 this year will have to sign up and prove their identity and age, which sadly means that some people may end up missing out simply because they don't know it exists. Kind of a classic German problem there. But on the other side of the coin, so on the cultural venue side, if you own maybe a bookshop or another type of cultural venue, you can sign up to sell tickets or entrance cards via the Culture Pass app and website. So hopefully this is a way to get a little bit of boost to sales by promoting it on this big cultural centralized platform. So if you're listening and you do know a young person, you should definitely tell them about this in case they don't know. Definitely. And what kind of things will young people be able to do, Aaron? Well, uh, as Imogen was saying, to uh, get people out of the house after the pandemic to support uh, the arts uh, afterward, the big emphasis is on live events. Uh, theaters and concert venues are where you're most likely to get the biggest benefit from the Culture Pass, but it also covers independent bookshops, art galleries, small business cinemas, uh, Amazon, Spotify, big uh, chain movie theaters. These kinds of vendors are excluded. So uh, think local, think independent, think higher culture like opera, theater, concerts, and you're good to go. And there's a lot on offer here, too, I would say. My boyfriend Michael and I often go to the Staatsoper in Berlin. It's a lovely place with a lot of uh, very cool uh, operas on offer. And quite often, it's uh, half price or even less than what you would pay, for example, in London at Covent Garden. Yeah, totally. I really do think that the cultural offering in Germany, especially big cities, but elsewhere, is actually amazing to be honest a lot of the live music there's live music every night definitely yeah I absolutely agree and I think you know even if you're not quite lucky enough to be in that sort of 18 year old age bracket there are ways of doing it affordably and that's something that's really promoted in Germany um, as Aaron said with the opera you can also I think get last minute tickets for last minute cancellations which can cost as little as 10 euros you know for, an, for a, a good seat at the opera um, and as you say live music comedy theatre you're spoilt for choice here really this sounds actually really great and it's it's good that the government is caring about the arts right definitely it is so refreshing to see governments prioritizing the arts making it their focus and coming up with a scheme like this that recognizes just how important it is um, and actually even finance minister christian lindner who's not necessarily known for being a big culture vulture he's much more of a sort of business focused politician he's found a way of uh, thinking of this project which seems to have kind of brought him round to the idea. Actually, he described it as cultural startup capital, <laughs> this culture pass. So that's, you know, that's whatever floats your boat, Christian. Classic, classic <laughs> Linder, yeah. Yeah, yeah. got to have startup in the title. Absolutely. It's an investment in the future of this, uh, this, this arts industry. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much for that, guys. One thing that many listeners will be aware of is that your neighbors in Germany might get involved in your business. It's definitely not every single neighbor, but it's fair to say that it's not unusual to receive a note through your letterbox with a complaint or a knock at your door. Germans are not afraid to tell you when they think you've done something wrong or something annoying. And OK, perhaps people have a reason to do that sometimes. But what I thought we'd look at today is what you can and can't do on your balcony. And this is inspired by some chat about smoking. So Aaron, why are we talking about smoking on your balcony? Well, a certain post made the rounds on Berlin social media recently about somebody who smoked maybe eight to ten cigarettes a day on their balcony and their neighbor complained, their German neighbor complained. And that neighbor asked them to text every time 
they were headed for a cigarette or to send, get this, a smoking schedule. Yeah, and later that same neighbor complained about too many texts, actually. (laughs) Seriously. (laughs) Um, It's ironic that someone who hates smoke so much uh, seems to have no problem gaslighting their neighbors, Mm. but (laughs) here we are. So they were disturbed by the smoke, obviously, and they wanted to know when they should be shutting their windows or something. Yeah, something like that in terms of asking for a schedule or to ask for a warning text in advance. Uh, All of this eventually culminated, though, in that particular neighbor then threatening to sue. Okay, so it escalated very much, though. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it got the threat of litigation was was put out there, which is a not uncommon thing you might hear. Uh, in Germany about disputes between neighbors. Very true. So what's this all about then? Can people smoke freely on their balcony in Germany or is it against the law? Well, generally, yes, they can. Uh, Although there have been some court rulings suggesting that you can have some restrictions on how often or when you smoke. Uh, In 2017, there was a case in Berlin where one woman was prohibited from smoking on her balcony between 8 p.m. and 6 a.m. because uh, her upstairs neighbor complained about the wafting smoke upward. Other times were fine, though. There was another case in Frankfurt uh, some years ago where one uh, man was basically prohibited from smoking on his balcony completely because there was a second balcony that he could smoke from that uh, did not bother any of his neighbors. So he was basically told, well, you can smoke on that balcony then. You don't smoke on this one. So anytime uh, anytime the courts get involved here, usually there has to be an individualized court order that is really customized for that particular situation. There's uh, where you don't have one, you don't generally have a blanket rule that says that you can or can't or when or whatever on, on your balcony with respect to smoking. If you are worried about legal costs from wacko neighbors, <laughs> and, and that really is whether it has to do with smoking or whether it has to do with something else, I once had one of my neighbors complain uh, to me about watering my plants with my hose at 8.30 uh, in the evening. Um, I told her that if she it bothered her that she could just shut her window. <laughs> Sie können einfach <laughs> das Fenster schließen is a very useful phrase sometimes. But if you are worried about this, you can always take out legal insurance, which can give you a little bit of a peace of mind. And ammunition, if they are to threaten you, I have it myself and I'm glad I do. Yeah, I feel like Aaron is recommending legal insurance (laughs) against neighbors almost every week on the podcast. I'm wondering if there might be an unofficial sponsorship deal going on somewhere. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe, maybe I just, (laughs) maybe I'm just, (laughs) I've just had it with neighbors in some cases. Yeah. Um, It's interesting because I don't actually have a balcony, guys, but I do get annoyed sometimes with the smoking from my from my neighbors. But I mean, I've never, ever thought, Okay, sometimes I do fantasize about telling them to stop it, but I've never actually done it. And I've never even thought about legal action. This is on your Einbogungs test, Rachel. Yes. I failed already. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got to work on that. <laughs> well, I have to say, I mean, I can absolutely understand being bo- people being bothered by smoke. And, you know, it's not the most pleasant smell in the world if you're not a smoker. But this whole idea that someone would be able to schedule their tobacco cravings does seem incredibly German to me and incredibly rigid and just frankly, very unrealistic. I will fancy a smoke at five to three. Yes. <laughs> I can tell you this in advance. <laughs> Germany is making it easier for people to apply for citizenship with a reform of naturalization laws. Under the plans from the coalition government, people will be able to apply for citizenship after five years instead of the current eight, and even after three years in some cases of special integration. It will also allow people to hold multiple nationalities in future without giving up their passport when they become German. The government published its latest draft of the new law last week, actually a little later than planned. Imogen, what has caused the delay and what's the impact? Yeah, so I think this one's a classic example of this rule of thumb that we keep coming back to in Germany. 
that nothing is really quite as simple as it sounds. Um, so we know that these reforms to citizenship and uh, particularly the dual nationality reform was originally one of the main points that united the three parties of the traffic light coalition. So that's the FDP, the SPD and Green Party. Um, and that was quite unusual at the time, given that they don't really agree on much else. Um, so all three parties have been really behind this, but it's actually been spearheaded by the uh, Interior Ministry, which is led by the SPD. We've heard that the other parties in the coalition have really perhaps partly been responsible for this delay, and particularly the FDP. So we know that the draft was circulating around in government way back at the start of the year. And at this point, uh, we believe that maybe internal disagreements started to hold up the process. So on the FDP front, uh, they've been putting up little hurdles in front of this legislation for quite a few months with various kind of caveats and demands. Originally, they wanted to link the liberalisation of citizenship with stronger deportation laws. And then later, they wanted to make sure that families migrant families, didn't hand down dual nationalities over generations and generations and generations. Most recently, though, the issue they've been arguing about seems to have been a financial one. Uh, basically, it's very important to the FDP that people who become German are going to pay into the system long term, and they're not going to be taking out of it, which in short basically means welfare. Mm -hmm. And so what are the new aspects of the draft that we can see? Well, the good news is that everything we've mentioned previously is still in place. So that's dual nationality, that's automatic citizenship for the children of foreigners who've lived in Germany for five years or more. It's naturalization at an earlier date, so after five or three years. Um, and it's also easier language requirements uh, for certain groups of foreigners. What's new is that we're seeing slightly tighter requirements for proving financial stability and also some more concrete red lines written into the bill that specify when you'll no longer be eligible for citizenship. So in the first instance, so proving financial stability, the bill says that people who apply for citizenship should be able to support themselves and their families without relying on long-term unemployment benefits or so-called Sozialgeld, which basically refers to other types of welfare payments that you can receive if you're on a low, low income. So if someone doesn't quite hit that bar, um, what they'll need to do is show that they've worked full time for at least 20 months out of the last 24, which could well exclude people who rely on some kind of social welfare to top up their wages. Uh, we believe uh, that this specific requirement was actually kind of shoehorned into the bill by the FDP and in particular Justice Minister Marco Bushman. So another key change is that a pretty controversial clause has now been scrubbed from the previous naturalization law. That was a clause that talks about integration into German living conditions, uh, which is pretty vague and open to interpretation and maybe in the worst case scenario also discrimination. Uh, so instead, we've now got two indications of the type of behavior that would exclude people from citizenship. So the first is if a foreigner is married to more than one spouse at the same time, so someone who practices polygamy, or that they demonstrate that they don't accept the equal rights of men and women according to uh, Germany's constitution or basic law. The second involves anti-Semitic, racist, xenophobic, or other acts motiva motivated by contempt for humanity. Uh, that's the wording of the bill. And that contravenes the basic law as well um, and would also prohibit naturalisation according to the draft. And is everything set in stone now? Well, the draft bill has been published, as we mentioned, uh, but it's still facing a fair few checks and balances before it actually becomes law. It not only has to be reviewed by associations and the federal states, uh, but will also face a vote in cabinet and scrutiny from the Bundestag. So at any of those points, there could be changes made. In particular, we are expecting there to be some pushback from the SPD on these conditions that have been set for proving that financial independence clause. So SPD MP Harkin Demir, uh, who's a rapporteur on the bill, has said he's keen to ensure that those tighter financial rules, so that's the clause stipulating that people who rely on benefits have to have worked full time uh, for the majority of the past few years, that that gets amended. Uh, he pointed out that this is likely to exclude a lot of women who may 
for example, have childcare requirements. That said, there are already some carve-outs uh, to this kind of clause mentioned in the law, such as people who migrated into the former DDR, uh, people from the guest worker generation, and also married couples with young children where at least one parent works full time. So it's possible that that could be enough to steer clear of some major disagreements on that front. And Aaron, what happens next? When might this actually pass? So as Imogen said, uh, the Justice Ministry has the caveats it wanted in this draft of the bill anyway, and the government is mostly on the same page now uh, and has sent out the draft law to the 16 federal states and uh, many associations uh, for a four-week consultation process. Uh, After that finishes cabinet, so just government ministers, uh, then has to vote on Uh, the draft as it then stands. Only then does that draft go to the Bundestag, uh, so Parliament, for debate. So the earliest German Parliament is going to see this is around June 19th. And that assumes that Cabinet is pretty fine with everything that's happened in the consultation and they can implement everything quickly, which, uh, of course, uh, they may have a few other issues or more time that they then end up needing. So even if we do see uh, this go to the Bundestag on June 19th, the earliest possible date, that's just three weeks before the Bundestag adjourns for summer on July 7th. Uh, The Bundestag could pass this into law by then, but only if parliamentarians are essentially fine with the government's draft as it is without a lot of changes. Uh, As Imogen has been saying, that's not necessarily the case. We can probably expect that members of the Bundestag are going to take some issue with the government's draft of the law, and they're going to try and make some changes of their own. Uh, That'll probably push the debate uh, on the law into the fall session. These things do end up taking time if you're going to negotiate and build support for those kinds of amendments. Uh, And so the fall session starts on September 4th. If this doesn't pass by July 7th, we're going to be seeing um, debates go on in autumn. So could it still pass this year? And when should we expect the law to actually come into force? So parliamentarians are going to want to get their changes in, but they will be. And you, our listeners, can also uh, have an eye on four dates. So those dates are September 29th, October 20th, November 24th, and December 15th. Why those four? Those are the dates when the Bundesrat meets in 2023 after the summer break. And that's the last hurdle for this law. Yeah. Um, So as the upper chamber, the Bundesrat does need uh, to pass this law as well after the Bundestag approves it. So we need the cabinet vote that we've been mentioning. We need the Bundestag to then agree to the law. And then we need the Bundesrat to then Uh, pass the law. If the Bundestag is serious about passing this law this year, they will be watching that clock and they'll be looking at those four dates in particular because they would need to have this passed in time for it to get to the Bundesrat in time for one of those dates. After the Bundesrat passes it, it goes to the federal president who will put that into law. Um, He doesn't get to object. He has a very ceremonial role. And then uh, we're looking at possibly an implementation period. So that's the big question that you said, when might this actually come in? That's still unknown. German authorities often get implementation periods uh, between when a new law is passed with a new set of rules uh, and when the new rules actually come into effect. And that uh, sort of grace period allows them to update materials they might have, including even application forms. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, they're going to have to have new application forms where you're no longer asking whether you're willing to renounce your original nationality, for example, things like this. They'll have to update information. They'll have to train staff on how the new law works, particularly if it ends up being quite complicated with some of these welfare uh, caveats, that sort of thing. Uh, So it's not clear precisely when that would be. What we've been told previously is, you know, by early next year, early 2024. Good to know. I had a chat about what it's like applying for German citizenship and about the new law with Sven Hasse, an immigration lawyer based in Berlin. I started off by asking him, what are the biggest problems that people face when trying to become German? 
Well, the main problem people um, run into at the moment is uh, the appointment situation. Um, at the mo at most of um, the offices responsible for naturalization, so it depends um, on the city uh, or um, the land kreis where you apply for. Um, but in most of the cities, especially uh, due to um, the situation with refugees. Um, uh, who came in 2015, 2014, and now uh, reach the, the years for naturalization, they are not capable to offer the amount of appointments required uh, for the number of applications, um, of applicants who want to apply for citizenship. So that is the main and the biggest problem. So are you seeing that people are having long waiting times to get the process, the ball rolling? Definitely. Yeah. So um, if I uh, describe it as it is in Berlin, in Berlin, we have also a special regulation or special situation that um, a central authority is going to take over um, the responsibility from January 24 on. And um, at the moment, the district offices are processing the applications and the district offices communicate that it is required to get a first appointment to file an application. On the other hand, there are no appointments. Um, they let the, the applicants know that um, they shall contact them again in 24, knowing that another authority becomes responsible them, then or um, some uh, district offices uh, frankly say, please uh, apply in 24 once the new authority is in force. That is the biggest problem at the moment. But the same situation you're going to see in Potsdam and Frankfurt and other cities. In your experience, are there any common mistakes that you see people make themselves when applying for German citizenship, maybe in their application forms or with documents? Not really. So the process itself is uh, quite straightforward. So what you need and what an advice can be is um, that you should care about a birth certificate. That is something you're going to need. The documents, foreign documents, um, need an upper still on it or a legalization, depending on the country it comes from. And that can be organized beforehand, before you start the application process. But, um, well, the other requirements are basically that you are not criminally convicted and that you can afford the living costs by own income. So it is required that you have a working contract basically to cover um, the basic living costs. And for that, they want to see during the process that you have, well, a working contract and pay slips. And that brings me to another remark that mostly it is underestimated um, the duration of the process. So if the process takes a year or two years and you just have a working contract running for a year, then you have to know that, uh, well, if the working contract is about to uh, be terminated, you need a new one. And the new contract has to be out of probation period. And uh, if it is just a year contract, you run into the same problem again. So that is a problem for, for scientists because at the universities, uh, you usually have year contracts or even shorter ones. And um, then uh, you have a problem. Yeah, that's good to know. And the German government is working on a big reform of citizenship laws. I'm sure you're thinking about that a lot. How will it impact people applying for citizenship? Do you think we'll see a lot more people applying? Well, there are two main points uh, with the new draft that was presented a few days ago. So point one, the timeline for naturalization is shortened from eight years to five years. That, of course, brings a lot of more applications um, on the moment the law is in force, uh, because you have three years more in the application process, so to say. Plus, in special cases, it is possible to shorten the timeline even to three years if you have C1 language skills and other special integration achievements, um, like um, a good job or a good um, education, or you work in an NGO, for example example, or even in a football club. So that brings a lot of more applicants to the process um, and to the right to, to apply. And the second one, the second uh, topic is that it will be allowed to uh, keep citizenship um, during the naturalization process. And one has to say that um, even nowadays, under the old law, more than 50 percent of the uh, applicants can keep their citizenship uh, because their law does not allow to give it up. But um, especially for countries with a valuable uh, citizenship with which you can travel, um, U.S. citizenship, Canadian citizenship, Australian citizenship, it is required to give up the citizenship. 
And um, my clients from these countries, they do not apply for German citizenship because of this reason. And they, of course, uh, would love to do so um, after the law has changed. So I'm not so optimistic that the appointment situation at um, the citizenship authority is going to change significantly after the new law has been implemented. Uh, in Berlin, they promise they uh, they want to be faster. They have 200 caseworkers instead of 70 in the district offices at the moment. But I expect a high number of uh, new applicants. Yeah, absolutely. And what is your advice then about people thinking about applying now, for example? Do you think that they should apply now or do you think they should wait until the law is changing if they, for example, want to keep their current citizenship? Well, if you apply, um, you are asked in the form whether you are willing to give up your citizenship, yes or no. And if you say, I'm not willing to give it up, the naturalization authority can um, immediately answer, please give us reason, uh, reasons for an exception, or we can uh, reject your application. So the law is enforced from the moment, well, it is published in the law books, and uh, from that moment on, you can keep your citizenship. If you want to apply before, um, you need to give it up. You need to answer this question with, yes, I'm willing to give it up. Once the law has changed, no one's going to ask you to give it up. Yeah, But of course, it is still in the process, and there is no guarantee that it is implemented um, in January next year. It is highly probable, but uh, yeah. So the answer is, if you want to be sure that you can become German citizen, then you should wait until the law is enforced, or at least it is signed by the president. And if you consider to give up your citizenship, or if you are willing to gamble a little bit, yeah, then uh, of course you can apply. We heard a bit about Berlin's problems there from Sven Hasse. What else do we know about the waiting times in Berlin? Well, Berlin is basically equipped to handle about 8,000 applications for German citizenship per year. That's how many it got in 2010. Now, though, Berlin is getting around 20,000 uh, applications a year. And there are currently 27,000 people waiting on their applications to be processed here in the capital. Uh, basically, there's been no improvement to administrative capacity in Berlin for well over a decade, something that will surprise absolutely no one who has lived here for mm -hmm. a certain period of time. Uh, and now people are waiting an average of almost two and a half years for a citizenship decision. Depends on the district. Some places are less, some are more. And it is meant to be um, centralized from next year in Berlin. So Yes, which is one of the reasons why a lot of applications filed this year in Berlin have been put on hold, waiting for that centralization. Great. Thank you so much, guys. Okay, it's light outside. Everyone is happy. We're getting into summer season. Not quite yet, but almost. Finally. So, yes, exactly. I thought we could chat about some getaways in Germany that you lovely people would recommend maybe for a day trip or a weekend or even longer. Imogen, what's your recommendation? Well, I have two actually, and one is particularly close my, to my heart and also very close to Berlin. Um, so that's the northern part of Brandenburg. So Barnim, uh, which is a big nature park, and also the area around um, Ver Berlinsee and Althotsdorf, uh, which is just this stunningly picturesque, um, quiet, forested paradise, basically north of Berlin, full of lakes. And just the perfect place uh, that you can reach in an hour and a half or so from Berlin. Get out either for the day for a bike ride or picnic. Or what I would recommend and what I normally do is take a long weekend and go to one of the many kind of campsites there. Bring your swim stuff, bring your bike, make sure you just get some lovely fresh air and a bit of an escape from the city. The other um, is Freiburg in Baden-Württemberg, which is one of my favorite cities in uh, Germany. It's so quaint and charming. It's surrounded by beautiful hills and if you're looking for more of a sort of nature-oriented break than a city break, it's so easy to get out to the countryside and the mountains from there. So I would recommend getting the cable car up a particularly high mountain nearby called Schauen's Land, which is kind of few in the country. And from there, on a clear day, you can even see the Swiss Alps. So it's quite an amazing experience. Great tip. Aaron, what have you got? 
Well, as I said at the beginning of this episode, I'm very excited about a little wine trip to the falls this weekend. But I think my favorite day trip, uh, from Berlin at least, is Lutherstadt Wittenberg. Um, it's a great little place where you can see the church that Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to. Uh, the Museum of the Reformation is a fascinating look at a tumultuous but critical time in European history. Uh, and you also have the Kranach House and the story of that uh, very famous painting family. And the best part, in some ways, is that you can see all of this in a couple of hours. Uh, and you still have time to sit down for a lovely coffee and cake and a relaxing lunch. And you can still be back to nearby Leipzig, Dresden, or Berlin in plenty of time. It's basically the perfect little day trip um, for a morning train ride and an afternoon uh, way back. Highly, highly recommended. Really lovely. So I would recommend Flowen Insel or Peacock Island. This is a gorgeous little island and nature reserve in the River Havel, which is southwest of Berlin. And it's not far from the Wannsee Lake. And you can go there and you take a little ferry over and there's loads of peacocks on the island and loads of birds. So it's a perfect day trip. I would also recommend Königsee in Bavaria, which is in Berchtesgaden region. And I did it, I was in Salzburg in Austria, and you can get the bus over the border, have a day trip in Königsee. I would stay there, but it's very expensive holiday accommodation. No. <laughs> yeah, um, maybe I will book earlier and stay there one day. But I would really recommend you just take your swimming stuff and get in the lake. It is really, really deep and cold, but refreshing on a summer's day. Yeah, um, Koenig Sea does look beautiful. And I know that it's also, I think, one of the most beloved spots for influencers to go because it is just so picturesque. And so if you fancy kind of going viral on Instagram, that's also something to think about. Um, oh, but you know. really one of the most stunning spots in, in Germany. So great recommendation. That's one of my favorite parts of the country. Like down in southeast Bavaria there, there's lots of lakes. There's Rian and Kimsee, where you can go into uh, one of Ludwig's castles as well in the middle of the island, in the middle of that lake. That's another good one in the area. And then you can go into Deutsches Eck, or literally German Corner. Which, German Corner? German Corner, yeah. Well, I mean, this is also what Austrians call it. They call it German Corner because it kind of like it kind of just bites into Austria a little bit. And a lot of uh, Austrian trains actually end up running through there. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, it became a problem during the, the strikes in Germany because they couldn't run these trains through Deutsche Sex. So they had to set up uh, shuttle buses between Salzburg and Kufstein. Um, yeah, yeah. Also two lovely border towns right on the border of Germany. And they're in Austria, but they're right on the border of Germany. So if you're in that part of the world, just hiking through the mountains or taking a little car trip. Those are nice places to stop for some lunch or something. Really good tips. So that's it for this week. Thank you so much to all our listeners. And we will add the links in the show notes for the stories we've been talking about. And please leave a review or rating wherever you listen to your podcasts, especially if you enjoyed us. This week's panelists have been Imogen Goodman and Aaron Burnett. Our guest was Sven Hasse and our sound engineer is Reese Edwards. We hope you enjoyed listening and we will be back next week. Until then, take care.